10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Hey, everybody. Uh, it's Laurie Peterson with the Capital Film Arts Alliance. And here is another episode of our webcast, uh, CFAA Film Talk. Uh, we have had um, some really, really great conversations. If you've missed any of them, know that you can always go to the website and you can always catch up on any of the past interviews. Last week's with Manuel Crosby and his team from the film First Date was uh, a a shit ton of fun. It was a lot of fun. Uh, so if you missed that, check it out. I'm really glad that you are here um, to join us for uh, tonight's conversation. Um, so mm -hmm. let me just touch base really quickly on some of the stuff that we have going on. If this is your first time viewing uh, the Capital Film Arts Alliance, we're a nonprofit association for filmmakers, writers, actors here in the Sacramento region of Northern California. Uh, we service um, our filmmakers and writers and actors in several different ways. Uh, the most recent with the pandemic has been with this webcast where we are able to keep everybody together and connected. So thank you for uh, making this so successful and so much fun for, for all of us. Uh, Steve is in the background. Thank you, Steve, for pushing all the buttons and making it happen. Uh, we have got uh, just some dates coming up. I want to make sure you guys have on deck. Uh, on the 23rd of March is our Screenwriters Lab that is a Zoom meeting that's taking place uh, uh, online. And if you're interested in participating in that um, or just checking it out, you can email us at scripts at capitalfilmarts.org. And then our writing coordinator uh, lab guys will put you on the mailing list and you can be informed of the links for when they do have their Zoom meetings and things that are happening. We've actually got some interesting things going on with our writers right now. They're doing a three page review. Uh, that's gonna be taking place on the 23rd. And then we just, invented a new competition for writers. We're conducting a log line contest. Uh, we actually have cash prizes, uh, $150 for first, $100 for second, $50 for third. Eh, it's not gonna pay your mortgage, but you know, what the hell, it's a lot of fun and it gives you some money to uh, just fill your pockets a little bit. Um, the log line and the information about that contest uh, is going to be due on May 11th, and then the winners will be announced on May 25th, and all the details are on the website, which is capitalfilmarts.org. On April 20th, for the CFAA webcast, we have Peter Bond. Uh, Peter Bond is a creator of Creatures. Uh, he's also a producer, and he's made some of the most bitchin' uh, animated figures and uh it, it's just what he's doing is really cool. He's got a movie that he's conducting or that he's producing. Um, and I don't know where he is with that. We'll learn a whole lot more about his process uh, at that point. And um, we're always looking for new speakers and innovative topics that you want to see us cover. So email us, go to the website. You can reach out any number of different ways. But uh, the website's always going to have the most current information. Um, and of course, we uh, appreciate uh, your donations. We have memberships and we have just donations for those of you who want to throw a few bucks towards keeping the train on the tracks here. And um, so with no further ado, I, <laughs> I'm surprised I actually haven't brought him on before because it's so much fun to have a conversation with him. Uh, Larry Maestrich uh, is a famed uh, filmmaker, producer, uh, distributor, and he has had some uh, comparable success in, with, uh, with his films in Sundance and with the Academy Awards and the Globes. And uh, he's had some real success in the projects that he has produced and the company that he has managed to, you know, keep going to distribute um, films as well. Uh, I don't think there's anybody. We just had a conversation earlier with uh, Manuel from last week's uh, webcast because I wanted to introduce the two of them. Uh, and, you know, of course, 
Larry knows somebody that Manuel has already talked to that has signed him through Magnolia. So there is nobody that he doesn't know and things that he doesn't have his finger on the button of. But he's also branching out into educating, uh, teaching uh, aspiring filmmakers, high school and college students, which is near and dear to our heart. And then uh, also kind of working on doing some production development uh, for his own kids. So he's going to tell us a little bit about that too. Um, so with no further ado, Steve, why don't you bring Larry on screen? Hey, there you are. Hello. I don't know about this log line contest. I think I might, I might be able to win that. Um, I don't know. I, I've actually already heard that several people are entering and it should be pretty competitive. Like the best log line? The or best log line. Can explain something the best? Yes. Yes. There, there is a description of what, what a log line is. And then it's, you know, just a few lines to basically introduce the, the film. Uh, you know what it is. It's not quite your elevator pitch, but it is something when somebody says, what's your movie about? Mm -hmm. They better be able to spit out in no uncertain terms and catch their interest. Because if it's somebody you're talking to that stands to invest or participate in your film, you don't get a second chance to yeah. say that the right way. So, all right, I'm, I'm entering. Yeah. And I, you know, some of the things that are really struck me last week with uh, Manuel's group, and they're just giddy about their, you know, success at Sundance is what happened to you at the beginning of your career and that's another area where I think it's really so interesting for everybody to understand, you know, when you've had a long career, where did it start? What was the motivation? What was the spark? Um, and I just want to touch, have you touch on that really quickly. And then also, um, you know, where you've kind of traveled it from, from there, but just a little bit about you, if you can tell us that. Um, well, my motivation was kind of a bad one. <laughs> um, NFL didn't call to draft me <laughs> senior year in college. And uh, the way I literally got into the, to the film industry, I knew nothing about it. Um, I had no background in it or family in it or anything. It was my senior year in college. Um, my roommate and I's girlfriend was a dancer at a club. You know, not like a stripper, like a professional dancer that they would have in a club and she came back one night and she's like hey they're they're looking for criminals for some movie and they're paying a hundred dollars a day you two should go down and you know my roommate was our nose guard so he was like six three like 350 pounds um so i was the smallest guy on the team so we go down to this audition which we have absolutely no idea about anything having anything to do with film or what's except for watching them. And it turned out to be a musical. So the first part of the audition, they're like, all right, come in here, come in here. And we're just being pushed along. We're like, okay. And you had to line up in a dance line and dance till they tap you out. <laughs> Literally. And, I had had knee surgery my senior year. So there came to this point in the dance where you had to jump and land in a split. So I'm like, I raised my hand because I don't know audition etiquette or anything. And they're, they're like, are you raising your hand? And I'm like, yeah, I can't do the split part right now because still have rehab going on on my knee and blah, blah, blah. They're like, well, why are you raising your hand? I'm like, look, I can't do that part. I got to skip that part. So they're kind of making fun of me. So the, the choreographer goes, well, can you sing? Which I can't, but they asked me in front of everybody. So I was like, yeah, I can sing. Yeah, no problem. <laughs> so like, all right, go in that other room and go sing. Meanwhile, my buddy, 6'3", 350, did the split. Shut up. Swear to God, they hired him on the spot, right? So now my buddy's got hired. And I'm getting competitive. I'm like, oh, he got hired. So the audition was literally singing to a song called Teardrops on My Pillow, right? <laughs> and there's all these actors and me, and they're all acting it out. Like, 
they clearly never took an audition in class, right? They're like, Dear Trucks, like, oh my God. like, like that. And I'm just, I didn't know the song. I'm just trying to follow along. So they pick me and they pick another guy and they're like, all right, you two got to go meet the casting director. So we're walking there and the guy's like, where do you train? And I'm like, well, you know, sometimes we go to Gold's Gym, but we have our own facility at school. <laughs> He's like, what are you talking about? I'm like, you ask him where we train. That's where we train. We work out at the gym. You know, blah, blah. He's like, no, where did you do your acting training? And I'm like, what? <laughs> There's such a thing? <laughs> and he's like, yeah. I'm like, where did you do yours? He's like, well, I went to Yale Drama, and then I studied at HB Studios. And I'm like, oh, fuck. <laughs> right? <laughs> so I'm walking in there, and I'm getting a chip on my shoulder because I thought they are just going to be mean to me, you know, because I wasn't qualified. <laughs> so the... The past, the casting director is a pretty big casting director now. Um, goes, you know, would you guys be willing to get a haircut? And this guy was like, I'll, I'll do anything, right? And I'm like, is it free? <laughs> <laughs> so she's like, all right, you're the dude, right? So it was a film called Cry Baby with Johnny Depp, and we were excited because there's Tracy Lords, so who was a porn star. And Patty Hearst, and it was John Waters' movie, and because we went to school in Baltimore, and uh, I was a an uncredited um, extra, you know, I didn't speak, so I'm like my part was literally lying on a prison bunk and crying, it was like crying to the song, but actually not really singing it because it was playback, and in a maximum security prison in. And called Jessup in, in Maryland, right? And I'm like, people do this shit as a job. <laughs> I'm like, I'm doing this. I don't have to get up and go put on a suit, blah, blah, blah. So I graduated and um my college football program had a really organized network of what do you want to be? Go tell the coach and he'll tell you a former player who's doing that now and kind of try to help you get a foot in the door kind of thing. So brother of a guy I played with was a location manager in New York City, and they hired me as a PA. Um, and on my first job, I was the only PA not related to somebody above the line. And I'm from the Bronx in New York City, so I didn't grow up in the nicest area. And we weren't shooting in nice areas. And the other PAs were literally terrified. And one night there was a knife fight on the street near our set. And like three of the PAs flipped out and like ran, blew up, blew an important take, like the whole thing. And I broke up the knife fight and like handled it. And I kind of got promoted to head PA. <laughs> I had locations PA actually. And I ended up literally working crew, like literally every day for three years except nine days. So I had nine days off in three years, including weekends. And I just went from job to job to job to job to job. Did you I, move up in in yeah. your responsibilities? Yeah. yeah. Uh, and I tried to learn everything. So I worked in the camera department. I worked in production design. I worked in grip electric. I worked in camera. I never did hair and makeup. Um, I did wardrobe one time. And then I liked being an AD, assistant director. So I kind of picked that corridor to go up with. And at the time, it was like a, a real renaissance in New York City filmmaking. So like I remember one really low-budget horror film. The the first AD was a guy named Miller Tobin, who, if you look up his credits, are ridiculous. Um, the second AD was Ted Hope, who ended up running Good Machine and now runs Amazon's film division. And I was this Ted second second. And there was a sort of core of ADs, John Panati, who ended up running Green Street and 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 a bunch of us all sort of said, we're going to do this for a limited time and start our own thing. And um, I did a, my first thing with Ted Hope. We, we did a, a short film with a guy named Hal Hartley, 
who was sort of an indie darling at the time, and uh, made it for seven grand, sold it for 30 grand, went on to do the next one, and kind of just kept parlaying that um, into Laws of Gravity, which was my first film, and we sold that to RKO, and then kept parlaying that, and then Sling Blade was like my fourth film, and then that parlayed us to a different level. Totally. And, um, you know, but what's interesting to me, my path up, I don't think exists today. Like, as a distributor now, I wouldn't buy my first film. Why? I wouldn't know how to market it now. Oh. You know, back then, it was all handheld. We were one of the first people to do that. That was a story. It cost 38 grand. That was a story. Um, it launched unknown actors. That was a story. You know, like Edie Falco was her first part and Peter Green. And that's not a story anymore. Nobody cares. You know, there's been a thousand handheld films and there's been a thousand low budget films that have gotten picked up. And there's no way to make noise with that film right now. It's a good film, you know, other than that. But how, how, how do you make noise? There's no clear genre to go after. There's no yeah. bars in it who could get press and, you know, the equivalent now, they would have really small social media followings, those actors, you know, now obviously they don't now, but at their sort of station back then, yeah. it'd be really, really hard. Um, and, um, you know, so I think about it because I'm kind of dealing with my children who are kind of at that stage right now in their careers and you know i'm like don't look at my credits to sort of model after because you know i don't know that that crew path is even open um because it's gotten so different like the technology is so different you know those were all on film so like you had to have much more labor right you know like even your camera department you had a loader <laughs> He had someone, you know, logging in all the all of the film. You know, you had five more people that don't even exist now on a crew. And even in post, there's like so many more people in post. <laughs> you know, now you can sit on a laptop like my kids edit on Premiere and stuff now. And I'm like, you guys don't get it. We used to have to splice tape. <laughs> you needed a huge room to hang everything in. You know, like it, you needed physical space to edit a feature because you had all, you know, hundreds of thousands of feet of 35 millimeter film yeah, and cans and the steam back takes up, you know, it's five feet wide. And, you know, it's just a very different way of approaching how to tell a story, you know, because editors back then had to make decisions where now, like I watch my sons, they can look at every possible permutation because it's easy in digital to do that. You know, mm -hmm. where to do that in film, it would take me ten years. Mm -hmm. And you know, they don't actually have to make decisions. They have to look at. I, I can look at every variable and then pick the best variable as uh, guessing which is the best variable <laughs> and putting that together. So it's just a really different way of filmmaking now or, or storytelling yeah, and it hasn't, it hasn't distribution um i'm amazed at how fast that has completely evolved into a different you know yeah. platform uh, just the concept um you and i uh worked together and at that point um when I was working with you, I can remember, you know, the big, uh, the big grand get is that if we had a film that we could get into some major, you know, uh, DVD distributor, whether it was Blockbuster or, or Walmart, um, you know, th those are, man, that was like the Mecca. And uh, at one point, streaming, you know, was starting to kind of just really get started. And I remember thinking, that's not gonna stick. You know, people want a physical DVD. Mm -hmm. They, they want something that they can take with them. Um, 
the the evolvement of that to streaming and what how reliant we've now become on streaming content and now you know my computer is being made without even a, a dvd player anymore so it's so uh it's a matter of um what was that 2000 you know 12 to to current so not even 10 years and it has completely flipped on its head uh -huh. as to how you go about marketing your concept um the concept that you had with your filmmakers and that i still think is really the way to go is build your audience before your film even starts shooting uh -huh. find a way to integrate with your online um you know platforms to get people to support you and watch the movie and watch the making of the movie and all the travails. So when it's ready to be sold, you press a button and boom, they're being informed about that. Yeah. Now you got to pick an audience, you know, like yeah. we have a film out now called hood pranks. Um, you can put the hood pranks.com and what, what we're doing as a distributor um and, and where we're kind of morphing is we're not trying to be the brand, you know, whereas Disney and Fox and those guys have always tried to become the brand, come to Disney and watch these things, come to Netflix and then figure out what you want. But Netflix is the band brand we're marketing through the content. So when you want to see hood pranks, um, which got pretty screwed by COVID because we had a 300 print release set up for April and you know, that, that went away. So we pivoted and just did, you know, direct online. But we drive everybody to hoodpranks.com. Not to redcoral.com, not, not to us, but to the film so that people can interact with the film a little bit more complexly. So they can email the filmmakers. They can, you know, we have a casting site, which we're launching, where people can try out for the sequel and, you know, do all of that kind of thing. But now you got to pick your audience. So that that film is it's jackass in the hood, and it's meant for people in the hood. Well, are gonna think that's the funniest film they've ever seen in their life. Mm -hmm. and, you know, uber liberal suburban middle aged women are gonna be appalled. <laughs> you know, but you can't make things anymore to appeal to everybody unless you're Marvel or. Um, you know, that's really, I can't think of things that appeal to everybody besides, you know, WandaVision and, you know, sort of that whole superhero genre, even like the big romantic comedies now aren't that big anymore, you know? Um, and, you know, I was saying before we got on, I, I'm curious to see what happens with theatrical. Um, I'm a movie goer. I'm probably always be a movie goer. I rather see things in the theater, but I think COVID showed people you kind of can watch it at home. <laughs> you know, yeah. if you look at what happened in the economy, huge spikes in in-home improvements. So people were building screening rooms. People were buying bigger TVs. Um, I just bought a house actually from a guy who's the pool guy in the county, you know, that makes all people's pools. Mm -hmm. He told me he was in a normal year, he'd get 700 increase to build a pool. He said from January to May, he got 7,000 <laughs> because people stopped traveling. So they're just going to build their, you know, and people think it might come back. So I'm just going to make my house nicer. Mm -hmm. And a big part of that is home entertainment. Yeah. So if I have an 80 inch TV and I can see at the same time it's the theater. I don't have to have a babysitter. I don't have to drive somewhere. I don't have to commit five hours to it. It's vastly cheaper. Yeah. You know, I could spend nine ninety nine on a download instead of for a family of five, you know, it's two bucks, two bucks a head and I can make my own popcorn mm -hmm. buy candy a very challenging time to, to own movie theaters yeah. and and for the filmmaking community it's a challenging time to to pivot fast enough you know so like that that's what i think young filmmakers out there need to be paying attention to all of these changes 
you know, COVID's kind of like nothing's guaranteed anymore. <laughs> you know, Sundance is online now, right? And a big difference, you, you know, like Berlin's happening right now online. So the fact that Berlin just did not happen, but it happened online is going to make that change. Because again, for all the distributors, the cost of going to Berlin, then Cannes, then Toronto, then Sundance, then New York, hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars. Or I'll just send you a link. <laughs> yeah. To buyers, you know? Well, it didn't it used to be the, that kind of um, pageantry, you know, was part of what put it in the in the news what part mm -hmm. of what you know the the marketing ploy was the big event so how do we create that kind of same focus and pageantry with new releases when it's literally something you're just sitting on your couch watching i I, I think the power balance is going to shift almost entirely to the celebrity you know those with followings yeah. We'll get audiences because it will be very inexpensive to talk to those followings. Mm -hmm. So yeah. those creators who can figure out a way to get 14, 15 year olds and up to 25 year olds now to follow them, to pay attention to what they have to say, um, are, are going to have a distinct advantage over, you know, traditional filmmakers who, are going about, you know, their, their business. And, and I'm not particularly political, but Trump hurt us. You know, we, we, when I first started in this business, if you were an American and you went to a foreign film festival with your product, you sold it all every time. And it's progressively two things have happened. We've had a couple of presidents that weren't popular ending with an extremely unpopular president who was antagonistic to the world. And then countries have their own homegrown stuff now. So like when I started South Korea, wasn't a big film producing economy. Now it is, mm -hmm. you know, Africa wasn't a big film producing economy. Now it's huge. Mm -hmm. India got bigger. China got bigger. And, those countries are now more interested in their own filmmakers than us. <laughs> and they don't like us. Well, so they're also paying attention to their content. You yeah. know, we as an American consumer are looking at that content and appreciating what they're bringing to the table. So opening the door. And, you know, so now it's a global marketplace, truly, as opposed to a truly American dominate. I think we still dominate probably the last American industry that is, you know, that may be tech that truly dominate um, worldwide. But, you know, we have to be nimble and mobile and um, figuring out how people are going to watch. Cause you know, we're, we're, we're the same age and the thought of people like watching like this on their phones to me, like, I don't get it. I never watch anything on my phone. Yeah. My kids will sit in a room with an 80 inch television set and watch on their phone. <laughs> like, dude, why don't you just put on the TV? Uh, I don't feel just that, that, that la that laziness, I guess it's like, I can just do this and watch it on my phone or I have to get the remote and turn on the TV and then click three or four times instead of one time. And you're just like the immediacy that they're used to is astounding to me you know and we have to pay attention to that because literally that netflix on the phone <laughs> netflix on the big tv one click versus five clicks and finding the remote you know and that's sort of sad but that my, my kids aren't the only ones you know <laughs> there's millions of people who are like i just gonna make it easy for myself you're kind of lucky in that you have kids of those varying ages that represent, you know, the, the, the new generations coming up and watching them is an education in itself. Oh, yeah. you, can't, you can't pick up by somebody else 
showing you. Living with it and watch, watching it happen is, um, man. Such an like the whole meme thing? Like, I literally don't get it. And they make fun of me. They're like, see this? <laughs> I'm like, yeah. You don't think it's funny, right? I'm like, I don't get it. They're like, a hundred million kids think it's the funniest thing you've ever seen. <laughs> my, my one son's like good at memes and it's gotten him a following. So like he can put stuff out now because people like his memes, they're going to look at his short. And then if they like his short, they're going to look at, you know, his TikTok. And if they like his TikTok, they're going to look at his film. And he he kind of really knows how to to parlay that. And he he you know he made a short that you know I don't get either. It's 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 funny. I get the I I get the premise. Twenty five thousand views, like boom, right? You know, twenty five thousand people to go to the theater to see your movie is is real money. Right, it's 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 a real consumer response. It's a real real reply, mm -hmm. and um, you know they just know how to do it like really quickly, really directly. And but but also that's a kid who'd go to a movie theater fifteen times a month, watches old movies, yeah, uh, watches foreign movies, um, likes contemporary music likes older music so like i'm seeing with the younger kids and i also teach now so um you know i'm on my seventh year of teaching so i've had you know and my class at the school i teach i have freshmen through seniors so i've had you know a true seven years worth of different grades mm -hmm. and and our foundation that, that we do this through we do middle school and and in high school. So I also have had like fifth graders up to seniors and, you know, it's, it's amazing who they've heard of. It's uh, what they're interested in is real dark. Mm -hmm. Isn't it kind of a gut punch what they don't know? And who yeah. Who they don't know. Yeah, that's amazing. <sighs> but like, if you look at the sports analogy too, like there's this whole underbelly that we don't know about as general consumers mm -hmm. of high school sports stars. Where, you know, there's a team out in California called Sierra Canyon. And LeBron James's kid plays on it. And Dwayne Wade's kid plays on it. And the kids on that team are celebrities. Like they probably have 10, 15 million followers in high school. They, they go play in stadiums. So all that AAU basketball is creating celebrities, uh, football, you know, hit tapes and, and the, and the, the, the highlight reels for some of the like elite kids. Yeah. Just gets out there so quickly. Yeah. And, you know, my, my son started making these TikToks and the amount of views it gets in the period of time it gets is freakish to me, <laughs> you know? So it's it's learning how to marshal that audience with your vision and your taste and sort of informing that audience on how to, how to absorb yourself, you know? And that's what's interesting watching, you know, my kids because um, they have a better handle on this whole cancel culture and you better not do that or you're going to get canceled and you better not say this or you're going to do that. And um, they're pretty aware of, of mis the mistakes that can be made on social media that can make people not want to see your work. Um that being said, people will still go to the movies. People will still watch television. You know, network television is still pretty huge. <laughs> um, you know, 20 million people will watch CSI the next time it's on. And, you know. We've also created all these other subscription platforms that have, you know, uh, it, you know, it used to be that 
you had Netflix. And now, you know, I think there's eight different subscription platforms that you can have that all have a different type of content. There's 280 now. 280. 280 OTT. <laughs> I mean, I'm just saying what I would subscribe to. Yeah. So, and, but that pivot came fast too, right? Yeah. Because like Netflix, everybody subscribed, and all of a sudden, Netflix started competing with its suppliers, like Disney and HBO. And then everybody's like, wait a minute. <laughs> You're going to make your own original content. I'm not selling you my content anymore. I'm going to make my own Disney Plus, and I'm going to eat your lunch. And then Amazon's like, well, wait a minute, we don't sell that, so now we're, we're going to do it, and we'll outspend you. So now you have, you know, seven or eight big subscription-based services, which when you start to subscribe to all of them, it's the same as your cable bill, right? However, are you going to subscribe to 40 of them? Yeah, right. Right. So what's going to happen and what we're kind of trying to pay attention to, because we're launching our own OTT platform as well, but it's not a subscription service. And that's why I'm saying we're going to market through the content. So if you're interested in seeing a film like Hood Pranks, we're going to make it available to you where you could buy it, you could stream it, or you could watch it free with ads. Or we'll have some for, and or we'll have a form of theatrical, whether that be in the movie theaters or we've started um, the process of putting together pop-up screenings for when things are closed, like in parking lots or, you know, football stadiums on the field in schools, you know, when you where you could watch in your car and not get COVID and sort of the whole drive-in concept. So there's an audience for hood pranks. There's an audience for that guy Manuel's film. You know, I haven't seen it, but I'm sure there is an audience if it did yeah. well at Sundance. Yeah. And... It's, it's connecting to that audience has become easier because you can just research where to find the people who you think are going to be interested in your film. And now you could send a link for them to pay to it, right? As well, a option, you, to buy it, you want to rent it, you want to watch it, you know, with, with ads. Right. When, when you give that money options as well, that just opens it up. Then you don't have to ask anybody to su subscribe or, um, or, or or go to a theater. So you have to pick your theatrical moments like really carefully now, you know, and that that, that, that statement's a post-COVID. Like during COVID, to be honest, it's not worth coming out theatrically. Yeah. So we can only sell 25% of the seats. You, you exactly. lose every time you screen. Yeah. So, you know, it, it's just not worth it. Um, but post-COVID, when theatrical's back, you just have to be smart and you have to be really calculated about it. I think theaters are going to have to do more. Like I think dine-in is going to become more common and yeah, you know, they're going to have to try to market the, the comfort of the seats, the things you can do in the theater besides the movie, um, the food, I, I, I guarantee you alcohol is going to start coming into play. And they'll start selling alcohol because it has a yeah. huge target margin. It's already happening here. Isn't that happening there? Well, I mean, in the dine-ins here, yeah. there, there's alcohol. Yeah. Uh, but like the big 20 plex. Uh -uh. Oh, okay. Not yet. Several but. theaters that have opened up to include alcohol and additional food. It's not the it's not the serving. We have one theater that does the full service dining. And full bar, but uh, you know the other ones are just basically your multiple theater food. You right. know, yeah. So <laughs> yeah, it's interesting times. It's like the Wild West again. <laughs> yeah, it is. It is. And you, um, so you haven't been, uh, or ha well, Hood Pranks was already done, right? You didn't produce that. You haven't been in production of anything for a while, right? No, we helped finish Hood Pranks. Okay. So we, we it was shot. We we produced the post and and, and getting it finished. Um, I, I took about twelve years off to be with my kids and not travel the world for production and just do distribution. But I've produced like three or four things in the last year. Just produced a film in London. Um, just beat COVID by like a couple of weeks. 
to, to, to get that done um, that Samuel Goldwyn's going to release, actually. And um, we're actually more producing series than films now. Yeah. So we're doing a, a slate of episodic, um, you know, reality shows. We have a cooking show. We have a couple cooking shows. We have sh um, a show at the NFL that's like a health-related show. Because um, those are easier to make and easier to finance and easier to sell um, than a one-off feature. Are you doing this under the next label or do you have a new... No, everything's under Red Coral. Red Coral? Yeah. Oh, okay. So, um, yeah, we're, the, the features have to be, you know, everything has to kind of line up. Um, the series are just easier. Yeah. You know, the... The, the, the guys like Manuel, who are the 10 who get into Sundance and get attention, that's one one thing. But the you know other 11,000 who didn't get in, I don't know what you do with those films now. Yeah. You know, that's, that's, a, you know, that's a hard thing to say. I'm going to take this indie film I want to make. Because the, the old way of doing it where you package it with some stars and then you go get some foreign pre-sales and yeah, you know, it's hard to get foreign pre-sales right now. Really hard. You need really big stars or a really specific genre, you know, mm -hmm. but that's what I'm saying. To make a laws of gravity right now, well, well, you know, well, how, how would you, how would you do it? It would be, you know, it would be pure equity risk. Yeah. And in tough times, it's hard to get equity investors. Right. So that being said, there's this constant catch-22 going on in our industry, right? So, like, I'm not trying to be, like, gloom guy. But on the other side, there's this voracious need for more content. Mm -hmm. So to fill all these 280 OTTs and networks, they need a ton of content and everybody just took a year off. So, you know, there, there's these holes in the pipeline. So it's just, well, that's why they're pulling out all of this, all of this content that was filmed, you know, in the last four years that didn't see the light of day. Right. Now it's, you know, coming out in full force and I'm blown away at how much is out there that really just kind of given a second life right now. Yeah, you know, it you look at channels like Pluto, right? There's a Johnny Carson channel. There's a Baywatch channel. <laughs> there's yeah. a Facts of Life channel. There's a like, you know, those are old shows, and people are watching it. You know, and again, people watch a lot of content because you can watch on your phone. It's not tied to your living room anymore, right? It's pretty much everywhere. You, you're going to be watching something or have the ability to watch something. So it's just really a matter of navigating your way of doing things within the landscape now, as opposed to modeling older people's navigation path. Right. You know, like, like what I'm saying to my kids and my students, make shit. Just make stuff. Yeah, you can go make something for a hundred dollars on your phone. See if you get an audience. Yeah, but keep making stuff so that people find your voice interesting. That's going to attract money to invest. It's going to attract other talent to be in it and and part of it with you. But like, make stuff. Yeah, and. You know, for my advice to any filmmaker out there, because, again, the cost of doing simple stuff, like like we just launched one of these podcasts like three weeks ago. I'm shocked how many people will listen to it. It's, where, where are you putting it so that it's getting that audience? I put how it on this thing called Buzzsprout, which okay. is like 
a platform that puts it on every platform. Yeah. Well, you go to one place and they put it on Spotify and Google and Apple and iHeartRadio. So we're on like 30 other platforms and then they administrate it all. Yeah. And it was it's super easy. You know, hmm. use the Buzzsprout and you know, like people in Slovakia like like I know I'm not marketing there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> And, and it's people are just content consumers, content absorbers, and it's some trial and error. But again, the cost of making stuff has so dramatically changed as far as the entry level stuff. You know, um, uh, you don't, it's up to you, Steve, um, if you want to post that or not. Um, but yeah, people might find that useful. Um, you can post hood pranks. Post what? <laughs> hood pranks. Yeah, hoodpranks.com. Um, Steve, throw that out there. And uh, yeah, people will like that. Uh, but, um, let me touch on a couple of questions that came up just so that we can not lose track of them. Um, lots of Sling Blade fans. Um, uh, Bex says Sling Blade is the reason why she had a month worth of late fees from Blockbuster. It was so good. Thank you, Bex. Uh, so I want to. I do want to talk a little bit more about that, only because I just finished binging the series Fargo. It's great, right? Ah, oh, so good! It is so good, and seeing Billy Bob there, it just made me think back to your experiences that you had with him too. So I do want to touch on that for a minute because so where um, he's the lawyer is really good too um, yes yeah called, uh, that one because uh, he, he only did the one season of Fargo right right that was such a good rocks in the new one have you seen that season that one's pretty good yes yeah I, 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 I would watch, say to people it. It was so good. what I do notice about sort of a difference between the people who kind of make it and don't it is is literacy in film and television so one of the th reasons i think my kids are doing well i i taught them and they do themselves they watch everything i watch everything whether i like it or not right just to see what's working what's like i just watched that too hot to handle you watch the beginning to end, or do you literally just click in and go, no, I'm done? I, I will admit I watch beginning to end just because it's a okay. respect thing for yeah. producers and directors. And I do, too. I can't help it. So I I'll finish it even if I don't like it. Yeah. But I'll watch that. I'll watch Fargo. I, I actually have a rotation where I'll pick something from one of the all of the big carriers each day of the week and you know, kind of catch up on – what people are talking about and, and, and what's working. And, y you know, I, I am also surprised. It's like some of the kids in my film class, like how little they watch what they want to do. Right. So if you want to be a filmmaker or an actor or a producer or a cinematographer or a musician, you should watch as much as you possibly can <laughs> sure. of, of everything. Yeah. crappy horror films to reality <clears throat> television to the classic you know you know i just watched uh, the subject was roses last night which is a film from 1968 when martin sheen was like 17 and you know patricia neal won an oscar and you know it's a great movie and was a play and, and all that so i try to watch from different eras and you know be a student of the craft um because watching stuff is like practice right exactly and i can remember i think it was you um that told me a long time ago when we were talking about the validity of content and you know what you what you make today and that it virtually just has no no expiration date because if you find the right audience or you find the right platform and I think you proved to me by just going through 
the cable listings of what movie was on, you know, what channel that night and where, what year it was made and being able to see that, you know, decades of content is still relevant. Decades of content is still being seen and shared and is still creating revenue streams. Um, you, you know, you tend to think that, oh, this movie I'm making today, I have this window for it to succeed. But, you know, that window is forever because it doesn't matter when you find the audience even if it's a dated content, there's always going to be somebody that's interested in that. And I've never forgotten that, you know, just. A good story is a good story, you know. And mm -hmm. what, what I find in, in, in again, in, in learning a lot on what to make these days from teaching and seeing sort of like, like what kids are missing out on, the, 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 the ingredient to great filmmaking is detail. So whether it's somebody like Quentin Tarantino, whose first draft of, you know, to live and die in Hollywood that, or whatever the last film, but Hollywood film he just did was like 900 pages. He actually wrote a book about <laughs> those guys experiences. And he really wrote the TV show that that guy was in so that when those characters are picked, the, the scenes and the parts for the feature, they're so layered and detailed that it's just great storytelling. Same thing if you look at a guy like Spielberg. His attention to detail and things like sound. Like, we use the same mixer for Sling Blade that he, he had for um, Schindler's List. Mm -hmm. Schindler's List had something like 1,500 soundtracks. And if you listen, once you're told this, you don't notice it, there's a constant train whistle Every time you're in the concentration camp, there's a ch -ch -ch with the whistle so that you hear it, but you don't know that you're hearing it. Yeah. That there's this constant, you know, new people to kill, new people to kill, new people to kill. It never ends. That sound never stops. Yeah. That level of detail is what makes great storytellers. So when I'm, you know, like the class I teach, my kids write and then direct their own short, and I bring in a professional crew to surround that. Touch on where you're teaching. We had a question. Connie Steinman asked, where, where do you teach? So we created a foundation called the 13th Man Foundation. And what we're trying to do is we provide um, the teachers and the curriculum for at-risk schools. So schools where the arts get cut. Um, we're also doing alternative sports. So sports other than football, basketball, baseball, soccer, which are typically well-funded. So hockey in the hood or tennis or track or a lot of the girls' sports get cut first. Um, so we'll bring the coaches and then the schools supply the kids and the space. So I've been teaching at um, a school in Montclair, New Jersey, uh, a high school. We only do high school and middle schoolers. Um, at a middle school in, in Newark, which got you know destroyed over COVID, frankly, because... My kids in that class, not a single kid in that class could afford a computer. Mm. So school got closed down. They just were out of school. Um, you know, it was the poorest section of, of Newark. Um, and then we were expanding last year into Louisiana, one in L.A., uh, Brooklyn, Bronx, Patterson. Um, so we're going to try to re revamp that expansion in September. When hopefully again kids are like our program doesn't work if there's no school. Like right now, I'm doing a Zoom class with the the school in Montclair, but it sucks to be honest. Mm. I I could I I think it's boring <laughs> me just talking on Zoom for an hour and a half. You know, it's like this is horrible. Um, but so they they so we're teaching at risk kids to be part of the arts and sort of the whole program is we also want to expose them to, you don't have to be the movie star to be in the entertainment industry. You know, you can be an editor, you can be a production designer, you can be a publicist, you can be an agent, you can be a lawyer, you can be a, there's tens of thousands of jobs that are not being Brad Pitt. Mm -hmm. And then I try to bring in speakers for the class, right? So, 
the saddest thing in my newer class, I brought in an African American woman because my whole class was was African American, who was a publicist to to tell them explain publicity to them like that's a, a job and it's something you could do and you know all of that. Um, not one kid in that class knew the word internship. Literally, they're like, "What's that?" She's like, you know, an internship. They're like, what? So nobody goes to that school or that area of Newark to look for talented kids to be an intern anywhere. They're just pushed through till they're out and then they're on the street, you know? So, like, we try to teach them about job opportunities in the arts and, and that it's a real career and, you know, you can make a living and, and, and do all that stuff. So my, my, my point in, 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 in seeing what these, these kids do is I tell them that I want the first draft of their script to be a hundred pages too long. And these, you know, these are short. So they're like five to 12, five to 15 pages, but I want you to think about backstory because as, as a writer, you're kind of God, right? <laughs> you get to create everything about this world you're writing about. What people look like, what they say, what they wear, where they go, what they do when they're there. You, you, you're in charge of all of it. So think of all of it, and, and they should have a reason for every single word that comes out of their mouth. Because every, every word has a cost in a script and should have a reason for being in there. And if you throw up everything on top of it and then pick pick the story that you want to tell, but you have a reason um, that um, you're doing it, 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 it's really good. And that's why organizations like you guys, where you're creating resources for independent filmmakers, is important because particularly in, you know, communities of color or rural communities, there's, there is no outreach. There's no resource or place for them to go to learn anything or to be recruited or, you know, I'll, I'll tell you another story. So my, my college roommate is from rural, rural Pennsylvania. <laughs> like there's like 400 kids in the town. Became very successful and decides to move back. And in that town, you're either an athlete in high school or you're like a meth kid who's in trouble. You know, there isn't like the arts there, you know, like you're, you know, you're, you're, you're gay if you're in the play. And, you know, there's still that whole sort of stigma. Mm -hmm. And his son um, wanted to be a cinematographer, a shooter, you know, regular cinematographer and editor. And he got hurt when he was younger in sports and he couldn't play. So there was zero outlet for him to do anything. And he ended up getting in trouble. And he actually lives with me now because his dad was like, you know, he wants to do this. He can't do it here. Will you take him? And I'm like, yeah, I'll take him. And great kid, smart. Where was he here? Why, where, why couldn't he do it here? No, he, he's with me because... There's arts here where I live, you know. Oh, where where was he at before? R rural Pennsylvania. Like you've oh. never heard of it. <laughs> like literally, you've literally never heard of it. Yeah. And you know, there's just trouble for him there. So like, there's no like if he wanted to do a short, there's no there's not you can't do it, you know. So we try to go into those school systems and say, yeah, let's make a little crew here. You do producing, you do acting, you do shooting, you do editing, and it works. You know, when you sort of expose kids to it, they're, they're, they're pretty into it. And it, it really, it really kind of changes their life. There was a girl in, in the Newark school who was just literally like, you could tell, she's like, I'm ugly, I'm a loser, I hated everything, wouldn't participate in everything. And, you know, it took me, our class goes from September to June. It's the whole year. You know, I'm some white guy coming into the school. And they weren't listening to me for like the first six weeks until I started bringing equipment. 
right? And I'm like, when you touch the camera, and this girl, like, she wouldn't do a short. She wouldn't participate in any short. And I, I made them each rotate um, a job, like shooting, booming, you know, editing. Because Shaquille O'Neal went to this middle school, middle school. So we were trying to make a video for him to come to see their shorts at the mm -hmm. end. And uh, as soon as you gave this girl the camera, and she was good at it, like naturally good at it. Like we were shooting basketball shots, and she like instinctively, you know, most people go like this because the ball's coming down. It's the wrong way to do it. She instinctively went up to catch it coming through the net, mm -hmm. right? Because if, if you're behind the foul shot, right, it looks like it's coming down. But if you point the camera down, you miss the whole shot. Mm -hmm. So she got it, right? And all of a sudden, wants to make her own short. I'm not ugly. And totally got empowered and started kind of being a leader in the class just because she got good at the camera, like, really quickly. And that, in a way, kind of saved her, you know, because in that school, you're so on a razor-thin edge between being in trouble and not yeah. um, that, y you know – those little things are important. So, you know, to me, the arts is, is we're the, you know, we're the keepers of the world's cultures and storytelling and artists are the first people to descent and there's tyrants and um, things like that. So, you know, we try to promote that that's a good thing to be. And, uh, um, and you should try it. Because you can try it now and maybe find an outlet. And that, uh, you're teaching multiple grades at the same time? Yep. Wow, that's got to be an interesting perspective. Yep. And the, the cool thing about that part of it, so like in my middle school class in Newark, I had a fifth grader. So that's a 10-year-old, Right. And then I had seventh and eighth graders. There's a big difference between a 13 and 14 year old and a 10 year old. But when you sort of put them in the context of let's make something and it's cool and you're volunteering to be here. So you're not getting graded, you know, they, they all kind of integrated really well. And this is a tough school. Like, like the kid who had the best idea his older brother was the head of the Crips for the city of Newark. Right. Mm -hmm. So like that kid's headed for real trouble, <laughs> you know, if, if he's not careful and we were the only thing he shows up to consistently. Wow. Like literally. Cause he got into it and then he started being nice to the younger kid. And, you know, cause there's no, there's no reason to have any confrontation. Because you all got to kind of get in lockstep to make something cool, like the Shaq video, you know, like talk about like why Shaq should come see you guys, like why you why you guys cool, like wh why should he come do it? And they got all into talking about themselves and you know promoting the Camden section of Newark, right? And they were all on the same team and kind of all got into it and entertainment and content creation and being an artist does that. Um, it, 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 just like sports do it. You know, even though you're competing in sports, you're not really competing on your own team. And if you notice, like a lot of even football and boxing, like the violent sports, at the end, everybody kind of shakes hands and everybody kind of respects the effort. Yeah. As opposed to, I think, a lot of different communities where it's just war, you know, to get yours all of the time. So, you know, like, that's why even today, like, I'm not competitive with this guy, Manuel, who I met. Because mm -hmm. we're all trying to do the same thing. Yeah, I'm like, I'll help you. You know, you want to ask me anything? Sure. I got, you know, no problem. Because you, you're, you making a good film doesn't take away from my ability to do it or my ability to release it, it just makes it more good films out there, which makes more consumers. Right. 
which makes a healthier industry. So great, dude. <laughs> glad I'm glad you're doing it. Um, so detail, doing this for the right reason. You know, like I want to be famous. You know, yeah. That's, that's not a great pitch. Yeah. You know, I'll do anything to make this. That's not really a great pitch. <laughs> yeah. You know, like it's more of a lifestyle than a job. <laughs> You know, good point. You never well, you know, um, script, you read scripts. I know you watch a shit ton of content. Yeah, yeah. I read. You read scripts too. Yeah, yeah you that's, that's my bath time activity. <laughs> <laughs> Without getting him wet or with getting electronics in the tub? No, I got that iPad that you could drop in the water. Ah, there you go. Oh. Scripts, if they're terrible, I will not finish. No, yeah. No, that if you're sucking by like page 10 or 15, I'm done. Yeah. Um, but good to know. It's no. amazing how many people are lazy about what they ask you to read. You know, because I think people don't realize they're asking you for money, right? Uh -huh. I get thousands to millions of dollars to make this the spelling errors not numbering pages or missing pages you know where there'll be like three pages missing and you don't know what's going on amazing like they just don't check An amazing amount of people well they don't they don't realize the value of that opportunity because you don't get it twice no you know if, if you blow it the first time you're it's going to take 10 times more to get in the door again. Yeah, because what people don't realize about people in my situation, I'm pitched 24 hours a day, wherever I go, you go to the dentist, he's telling you about his nephew, um, which was a fuck up on my part. I was, <laughs> my dentist was like, has, this was a long time ago, was hassling me about how talented his nephew was. And you're just like, whatever, dude, are you charging me for this? <laughs> it's like, that's my job. You know who his nephew was? Who? Adam Levine. <sighs> <laughs> so shame on me, but, um, but yeah, like wherever you go, you're just oh, like, hey, I got this great idea for a movie. Yeah. And so many people don't know what or a series, you know, like why do you think it's a great idea? Well, because you know, me and my friends are crazy and we do this crazy stuff and we own this restaurant, all this crazy stuff happens. I'm like, yeah, why is that interesting? Why do why why does somebody in Des Moines care about what you do at your restaurant? Like, what's the story? You know, and, you know, the backgrounds of all of the crazy people who come together that you're going to try to, we like, the, but there's no thought process to the, like, everybody thinks they're a movie or their life story is a movie. But it's rarely the case that, you know, that it is or that the real story is the movie. Because a lot of those true stories are very fictionalized. Yeah. Yeah, that's so true. So I'm sure a lot of people saw Remember the Titans, for example, right? I thought it was a great movie because there's all this drama leading up to the last game, right? Yeah. The Gary Bertier character gets paralyzed, the white guy and the black guy, and they're, they're friends, and everybody stands up for each other. The truth about that team was that team was so dominant all year that every game they played was a blowout. <laughs> I'm a friend of mine played in that championship game. Mm -hmm. They got killed, right? That guy, Gary Bertier, got paralyzed three years after high school. He played in that game. <laughs> he dominated in that game, like, you know. Um, but that's not drama. It's not compelling drama. So they fictionalized kind of parts of it to make the rest of the story – Attractive because if, if you watched a movie where every game's a blowout, it's not fun anymore. It's not an interesting yeah. story. Yeah, you gotta care. You gotta care about yeah. who's gonna win so, it. Yeah. You know, 
again, that's why you got to watch everything and you got to kind of do your homework and, you know, right. all of that kind of stuff. It, it, it amazes me um, what kind of content is created without any, any thought of what's coming next or what is your individual voice that's coming even out of that movie. And when I worked uh, as a co-director with the Sacramento Film and Music Festival and the first, um, I think the first or second year I decided I really wanted to get involved in, you know, looking at the films as they came in and helping to, to you know, pluck whatever was gonna be selected for screening. And, oh God, all it took was, you know, one year of doing that and going, yeah, never mind, you guys can do it because that was painful. That yeah. is fucking painful. We had, you know, uh, 600 submissions and 10% of them were even worth uh, screening. So that means that you're watching 90% of some really badly made movies and it's all fixable stuff. It's all the, you know, the, the editing, the audio, the uh, everything that could have been fixed and it wasn't done before they have, they took their shot. You take yeah. a shot and you blow it, you blow the shot. It's just how that's not understood um, blows my mind because it is such a huge effort. And I know that a lot of times it's just the, the thought that I've completed this film, therefore you must love it. Therefore audiences must love it. I love it. Um, but without really being able to step away from it and going, how does it, how does it really match up and being brutal with yourself in asking the hard questions about what you need to do better. When well, I talk to a filmmaker who doesn't think it very personally, right? So just to be honest, as a distributor, I couldn't care less about your journey to get your film made. Mm -hmm. I don't care whether your mother's sick. I don't care that you had to sell your last Tootsie Roll, I don't care. It's not my problem. That's your problem. My problem is taking what you made and getting somebody who doesn't know you to go purchase it and to go watch it. And just like, do you, where do you buy your groceries? Yeah, Safeway. Do you care about the manager at Safeway's personal life? Not one. Right. You go to buy based on... Is the produce good? Is it a good deal? What, whatever your grocery choice is. When you go to the gas station, do you care about that guy's personal life? Yeah, no. But, but people bring their personal life to the table with us in an in, 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 in inappropriate amount. <laughs> well, I, I you, you know, I, 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 I did eight years and, and I, I spent, I don't, I don't. I mortgaged my house. That's your fault. Like, yeah. Why did you do that if you didn't know what you're doing? You know, and I can say that as somebody who who took those risks. I I put Sling Blade on my credit cards. I didn't have the money to make that movie when I said I did, and you know, but I I knew I knew how to make a movie. I didn't just like willy nilly do it and hope for the best. So tell that story a little bit, just because I think out of everything you've done, because it was you know an undertaking that was new and fresh and you really threw it all on the line and hoped, you know, that you would recoup uh, and your experience in working with uh, Billy Bob, because I think a lot of people, if they have the same meeting with Billy Bob that you did the first time, they'd have been like, I'm out. <laughs> yeah. I can't deal with this guy. Um, so when you knew that you wanted to make, that movie what led up to that and how did that how did that take place so there was a short of sling blade before yeah. it, w it was a it was a movie that billy bob um didn't direct but um had written and starred in and it's basically the first 20 minutes of the movie and actually a really good director a guy named george hickenlooper who who died who made hearts of darkness had directed it and <laughs> you know, just to circle back, the biggest trait you can have in this industry, in my opinion, is to be opportunistic and to just be 
unabashedly opportunist and, and you know and not be sorry or ashamed of it so i was making a movie called new jersey drive at the time um with spike lee and a director named nick gomez and you know we're you're always raising money right so i don't remember how we got to this guy but we got to some guy whose father had sold a regional telephone company for like a billion dollars he came to our set to meet with us. <laughs> I didn't know how to raise money at the time. I was like, give me some money, dude. You got a lot. Give me some. Right? And he didn't. But he's like, oh, I made this short. We're like, yeah, whatever. Give me some money. <laughs> right? So like a couple weeks later, it was raining and we had a delay. So we popped the short in in the trailer while we're waiting for the rain to stop. And I'm like, wow, that's really good. Because <laughs> um, the short was really good, too. So... I was at William Morris at the time, and I, I called up William Morris. I'm like, D do you guys represent Billy Bob Thornton? They're like, who? I'm like, you know, this guy Billy Bob Thornton. And I'm like, oh, yeah, 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 we represent him. I'm like, can I meet him? They're like, sure. And he had done, he had been somewhat successful already. He had done Evening Shade as an actor. And yeah. he had written um, one of Carl Franklin's early movies that did really well called Devil in a Blue Dress. Um, that Denzel Washington was one of his early movies, too. So, like, he was in Hollywood, but miserable, you know, in sitcom world. And he only got to play the redneck and, you know, the southern bumpkin and, you know, all that kind of stuff. And Billy's actually extremely smart and extremely well-read and extremely literate. So, like, having to constantly be like, all right, dude, you know, was not mm -hmm. cool with him. So he hated producers and just in general. So I go to meet with him. And, you know, we're not fancy people, Billy. So we're set up in this conference room with the suits and fruit and a bulletin board that prints and, you know, just a weird environment. And, uh, you know, I'm like, how was it working with George Hipkenlooper? And I'm, I'm, I'm not going to use the word on this thing, but he was like, not good. And uh, so I'm like, well, would you consider directing this if you wrote it? I don't have any money, but do you want to do it? And he's like, okay. And he's like, I'll give it to you, you know, whatever, three months. He gave me a date, <laughs> like a specific date. I'm like, okay. And I left and showed up on that date. And he was like, when are we starting? So I went with April Fools. So I'm like April 1st. And uh, he's like, okay. <laughs> and um, I used to produce segments of America's Most Wanted, the, the TV series. And the way America's Most Wanted would work back then is they would give you the script and literally cash. And then you would put the bulk of the episode on your personal credit cards. Because you'd go shoot it in like six, seven days and you'd edit it in like six, seven days and you'd put in all your receipts and then you would get paid back by the network before you got your credit card bills. So I had like crazy credit because <laughs> I was charging like eight, 900000 a month and paying it right off of, you know, Fox's money, right? And uh, so when the production office, nobody knew this at the time but me, but when we opened our production office in Arkansas, I had only raised 40 grand for like a $900,000 budget. So I, I charged it on all of the credit cards I had. I wrote Discover card checks for payroll, and I put about 600 grand on Amex, that I didn't have and uh, charged it. Amex that you have to pay off. Yeah, yeah, that didn't work out for them. <laughs> so I, I would get on the phone with the Amex guy and make payment plans. <laughs> be like, look, I'll pay you $2,500 next. And I owed like $600,000. I'll pay like $2,500 next week and then like 50 grand the week after that and then 100 and they would go okay and then I'd pay the 2500 and I'd duck them for like a month and then I'd do it again so yeah I'm, I think I'm banned for life at Amex but um, <laughs> eventually paid it but um, I did negotiate the interest away but um, <laughs> yeah so we, we, we I'm not saying don't take big risks because that would be hypocritical because I, you know, charged my future on credit cards to do that. 
but I didn't do it in an uninformed way. It was a great script based on a great short. Billy put together a fantastic cast. You know, you, you, you saw what you were getting with how he approached being prepared for the film. So that film, Billy was so well prepared as a director. We shot 18 days. I think 11 of them we wrapped by lunch. Wow. There was no overtime day. 18 days, that's all? Yeah. Wow. And he would wrap by lunch. We were doing like, normally you do seven, eight, nine, ten takes. Three. Like, he was beyond prepared at every level of detail. Like, beyond prepared. And and because he was so prepared, it was so easy for the rest of the crew to be prepared, shot list wise or wardrobe wise, or hair and makeup wise, and you know all that kind of stuff. It was also pretty simple locations. You know, everything was relatively close to each other; nothing was difficult to get. Um, and then part of this business is a lot of luck. Mm -hmm. Didn't rain for eighteen days. It was some perfect weather for eighteen days in a row, like. How can you plan for it? Nobody got hurt, actually, except for me playing basketball um, when I shouldn't have been, <laughs> which so it didn't matter. Like none of the crew or cast got hurt. It was literally just me. They all got along. Like there wasn't, you know, crew tension or actor tension. Everybody was like pretty, pretty close friends. And when you have a director who's prepared like that, your crew's not tired. You know, they yeah. were at the pool. <laughs> every afternoon because they made their day, you know? So you didn't have people working 16, 18 hours and a quick turnaround and they're irritable and they're tired. People were well rest, well fed, and they really respected Billy because he was so on point creatively or on set that you knew what you were getting. You knew it was a good film, you know? You didn't know it was going to do what it did, but you knew he was going to make a good movie. Yeah. Where'd you find the kid? Is that just central casting or? Yeah, we saw so many people. His name's Lucas Black. Um, who's, he's gone on to have a decent career. Um, but Billy and the, and the, he had a regional casting director, um, looked at probably five, 600 kids. Wow. Yeah, um, incredible. He had had one credit, I think, before that. And his idea was to put Dwight Yoakam in. That was his first role, wasn't it? Yeah, that was Bill. You know, Billy and Dwight were good friends, and and Billy did Evening Shade with John Ritter. Right. And uh, oh, Billy was his cast. I, I don't, I don't get any credit for that. Wow. But um, you know, he knew most of the. Some of those people are people from his hometown who were not actors, like the mother, um, the guy at the, the, the vacuum store. They went on to do other acting, but they were not actors. They wow. were like town folk. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, so it was a different part of the world. The house we shot in, those people moved for a month for us just to meet Dwight Yoakam. <laughs> Jeez. Literally. Wow. Like you could we could have bought that house for 10 grand. But they just wanted to meet Dwight. And they like, yeah, we'll go to our family's house. Well, thank you. And they got pictures with Dwight, all they cared about. So here you go. Knock yourselves out. Wow. And I'm sure it became you know, you know when it was done and it was, it was Really, when it by the time it was done, did you know before it was out and getting response? Did you know what you had? I knew it was really good. Um, we were worried that people would get it. Um, it didn't open, so Miramax, like Harvey, was, <laughs> took a lot of credit for stuff. But Harvey opened that movie on two screens. Mm. And then Elizabeth Taylor and Sylvester Stallone came out publicly 
and gave quotes and said it was the best film of the year, and then he went wide. But he, he didn't go wide at the beginning with that. Elizabeth Taylor and Sylvester Stallone. Yep, and we, none of us knew them. They just loved it. Wow. And they like camp, kind of campaigned for it, and then Harvey went wide. Yeah. So... Yeah, there was a lot of crazy shit with all of these guys. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, and I can remember <laughs> that was I remember that was when Billy Bob was married to Angelina Jolie. No, he wasn't yet. Oh, he wasn't married to her then? No. How but not long after that, right? A little ways. Um his wife at the time filed for the divorce the day after the Oscars publicly on Howard Stern. Yeah. Wow. There's a lot of drama <laughs> that we dealt with. A lot, lot of weird weirdness. But yeah, she uh, she was planning it the whole lead up. Yeah. To, to, to get him. So she was, she was a little ways after that. Crazy. Yeah, I can remember uh, uh, Diane Ladd, you know, hated you because Laura Dern was married to Billy Bob. And when they broke up because of Angelina and you were friends with Billy Bob, Diane Ladd assumed that, you know, you were on their side. It was like, you know, team Billy Bob. Yeah, I always get blamed for everything. So but that's fine. We made up over a film, though. What was it? Uh, well, Cut Poison Burn. Cut Poison we, Burn, that's uh, right. We distributed yeah. Cut Poison Burn, and uh, we did a screening in... Uh, Congress, right? In D.C., we did that screening. No, 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 no. This was... Well, you did, but this was... There was a screening in... Um, oh, shit. Uh, Southern California. It'll come to me. And um, she actually invited uh, Donna Navarro, who was the subject of the film, That's and right. me uh, as the representative of Next um, to stay with her at her home for the weekend. So That's right. I had an amazing weekend with somebody that I, I treasure and I value so much. But I just remember that, man, she had a... She had a, a burn, a burn for Billy Bob. She did not like what he did to her daughter. <laughs> no. But Donna's doing good. Is she? I yeah. Love the Donna. Yeah. 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 That was a that was a tough film to to market that one. Yes. But um, yeah. I mean, I, you know, the the really interesting thing with all of this is how everything gets connected and is remembered and it leads into everything else. And I can't think of it when it comes to filmmaking until digital became available, that process never changed. I mean, you basically made movies the same way until you could edit them digitally or until you could shoot di digitally. Mm -hmm. Movies were made the same way. Movies were distributed the same way. It was just kind of the, the inner workings that had to change as the system evolved. It has completely flipped on its head since then. Um, and that has not been that amount of time. And it's continuing to evolve because what we're seeing is the systems are changing so, so quickly. Um, the equipment is changing so quickly. The platforms are changing so quickly. It's like, what a fucking dance to just figure out um you know how to make the most well when i tell my my kids that when you shot 35 you had 10 minute reels you couldn't that's it then you have to change the film they're like what <laughs> like, yeah dude <laughs> we have to stop and change the film every 10 minutes yeah and you know and sometimes less because if the take was going to go 10 minutes and, you know, if it was two minute takes, but you only had, you know, X amount of film left. That's why you had literally somebody keeping track of your feet of film. So you didn't run out of film in the middle of a take. Wow. Really a job. 
right? And then you'd have somebody in the camera bag sitting there changing the negative, you know, to go into the camera. Ten minutes. That's all you had. Wow. So. Well, as a matter of fact, I have three film reels that belong to you. They're sitting in my garage. <laughs> I'm sure Mary McGuckian wants those back. Yeah, right. <laughs> I'm sure she does. <laughs> um, but yeah, so like, just think about that. If you have to only can think in at maximum 10 minute increments. Yeah. Which really meant you, you were talking in like five minute increments because you, you know, if your take was anything over three minutes, you'd have to change the film at six minutes instead of 10 minutes. And the whole big math thing to do all day. Mm -hmm. And then you got charged by the foot to develop it and by the foot to print it. So even like distribution, right? When we were distributing on film and 35 prints, each print costs like 2,500 to make and about 500 to ship each time you ship it. So if you did, you know, a 500 print release, you, you had spent 300 grand on shipping and printing just to get out, just to be in the theater where now it's a drive, you know, like literally a drive like that big. Yeah. You know, and you had to ship it with special shippers because they came in these huge canisters. Yeah. That are heavy, like, like were heavy, like 50 pounds. So you had to have a film shipper. You had print trafficker was a job, just figuring out where everything was. You know, it was, it was a lot of overhead. And yeah. again, that's why you had to make choices yeah. as opposed to decisions. So um, now we have COVID compliance officers to add to the, yeah. to the mix. Yeah. We've yeah. lost some of those positions, but we've gained right. the others. Testers. So, um, but yeah, it's just really, and it's, it's changing every quarter now as opposed to every decade. Feels like that. Yeah. You know, as soon as you buy a red camera, you need to go buy a Canon and then red comes out with a new one. And then, you know, you got to upgrade all your posts. and But, like, I got the school in Montclair to buy Premiere for everybody. Mm -hmm. These kids are learning how to edit off YouTube videos. Like, my, my son, Jamin's a good editor. He literally learned how to edit off of YouTube. Hmm. Wow. And then practiced. Like, all the fades and dissolves and all the little tricks and you know color correcting like he literally just taught himself color correcting hmm. like when i was his age you had to go to a lab <laughs> yeah you had to have a very high-end colorist who made like 800 dollars an hour mm -hmm. to color correct your film because it was literally on film you're doing something cool with your students um and it actually models something that we're trying to get off the ground here in Sacramento. And we're very, very close to having that happen where you have industry professionals um, that are working hand in hand uh, with you to be able to give input, to give industry reference and input and have ownership of people within the industry to, um, to tap, you know, the projects that they're making, and and the same thing that we're we're working on here, uh, on on some levels to give the opportunities to students um, to learn and grow and gain uh, credits and industry connections by working, not by paying a half a million dollars for a fancy education that they then still have to prove themselves you know, and, and get out in the field and do the job to be able to know that someone will hire them. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that that's really key to growing successful film filmmakers, especially in some of these areas, um, like where you're working, where it's underserved communities, yep. um, so many talented kids that just aren't being given the opportunity 
So I, I really love that you're doing that. And I love that we're working on having that developed here as well. Um, because we can't rely on everybody who's going to make great content to come out of film school. Uh, you know, all we're doing is creating an incredible amount of debt. And really what they need is the opportunity to work in real life situations yeah. to see if improve themselves. We, we had a shoot today with the Hood Pranks guys. We're, we're doing another thing with them. And part of our 13th man thing is we have an uh, intern or an apprentice in each department, including actors. So, like, had a kid in the camera department today, had two actors who were apprentices today, um, who, you know, got a, whatever we did, an eight-hour, nine-hour shoot under their belt. Um in cold weather because you know cold weather affects the equipment <laughs> and you know like this one kid was like kind of surprised today about you know like the gimbal starts to slow down in the cold <laughs> and he was like really i'm like yeah dude <laughs> it's cold out today and windy and the sound and you know he just started learning why you do the the procedurals you do on production why it matters to permit the street you're on so a car can't drive down it because when you didn't and a car drove down blaring the radio we're doing it again yeah we're doing it again until that didn't happen and then he's like oh, that one little thing that you know these tiny little mistakes snowball into to, to big problems yeah you know and that mistake today, one of the actresses was visibly shivering. Which it's supposed to be summer. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm like, so, we making so much fun. <laughs> keep her in the car until she could stop and then do it again. You know, added two hours. <sighs> Just that. She was, she was, she was cold. Yeah. You, you know, <laughs> and it's like, that's not going to work. So, you know, it, it's important. That's why I'm saying there's there, there's no way to practice this except for watching stuff and shooting. Yeah. You know, you don't have to keep what you shoot. Yeah. Just the act of doing it is important. So just to um, touch back to, you've actually created two different studios, but now you're moving into, you know, production on a whole different level. Um, what, what, what did you take away from your first experience where shooting gallery was one of the first independent film studios? Um, you, you produced an incredible amount of content through that. And it, uh, you guys have up and running for about 10 years, almost yeah. 10 years. Yeah. Um, and then to leave that and to then figure out what you're going to develop next. What did you learn from that first experience before you went into creating next? And then what did you learn from that before you went into 13th man or red coral? What's the, what's the beginning and what's what? So the, the best thing so for me for for shooting gallery was getting humbled you know i my my early career was this mm -hmm. and you know you get a big head and you get cocky and you think whatever you do is going to work and then we we you know the, the story behind shooting hours we sold it to an internet company and they went out of business and took us with them so all of a sudden it happened like overnight so all of a sudden, you, you know, you think you're this and you're this. <laughs> and it was actually, though, really kind of good for me because I think I was becoming a dick, you know. And, mm -hmm. you know, having to start over and figure it out again, um, pay attention to different things and, you know, kind of be more present, help me get to the spot now which i don't think i would have gotten to if it just kept going like this i think i'd just be a dick and 
I'm kind of happy I'm not a dick. Yeah. <laughs> um, so th that was, you know, my biggest takeaway from that is, you know, this, this industry is very much like sports. It's like, I don't care that you had a good game last game. Like, what are you doing this game? Yeah. You have to perform every day. Um, there's really no room for um, any kind of excuse. It's like, because again, the public doesn't care. And you are also, we're also the public. <laughs> we don't care about, you know, Warner Brothers problems. I, I don't care. You make something I want to watch or you don't. You make something I'm willing to pay for or you don't. All of the other stuff that you have to go through to make that, I don't really care. So that that part of having to wake up every day and strap up and it's it's game day every day, getting humbled once is helpful in that. Um, you also have to wrap your head around um, never actually being finished with work, which I think really hurts a lot of people in our industry who never figure that out. So there, I cannot remember a day where when I went to bed, everything was finished that was supposed to be finished as running a company. Obviously in production, you make your days, you're done with that. Yeah. But if you're doing more than one thing at a time, you will never be finished. And until you get comfortable with that, yeah. you're going to be nuts. Um, and it's going to affect your relationships and it's going to affect um, your time management abilities. And, you know, having a company blow up on me, I refocused on my kids. And I coached and I made sure I was home and I made sure I was present and, you know, wasn't always somewhere on location and kind of didn't really know them very well. So, like, having that and then sort of, being able to shepherd what they all are interested in being in the entertainment industry. Um, and I'm part of all what they're doing. Yeah. I want to talk about that a little bit because, um, you know, when I knew them, they were so little and now they're really branching out into creating their own individual types of content. And how can you, how can you help them? Because you've had to learn mm -hmm. this whole new aspect of, you know, the content they're creating, um, Payson with music and uh, Jason with his filmmaker. What's Quinn doing? Is he creating anything? Yeah, Quinn actually started a company, um, which I can't really talk about yet because it's okay. a really good idea. And um, I don't want somebody to steal it from, from under him, but he's going to announce it probably in May. May June, so maybe we'll come come back and talk about it. Okay. But it's it's a it's a tech concept surrounding the the entertainment world. Um, it, it, I can help them in different ways. One, I can have conversations like this. So like, and and, and they're different. My daughter has a very specific skill set. My daughter can sing, um, like legit. She can sing all of the ranges. Um, everybody who hears her is like, oh shit, you know, she can sing and she can also write. So I help her by kind of keeping her away from the wrong element in music. So I manage her in the fact, I don't want money for it or anything, but that I don't know that much about music, but like, I'm going to be at the studio. So you're not going to get raped <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> or leave leave it to in the morning by yourself in the city that that's not going to happen so and i can help her on the writing side and editorially you know give notes and i can help her on this is what you gotta expect and this is what you gotta do because again something that people don't understand about our our industry is we do our job in public which means a couple of things it means Everybody thinks they can do it, hmm. particularly successful people think, well, I was successful in, as a hedge fund manager, so I could be a movie producer. 
or I was successful as a, you know, a doctor, so I could be a director or an actor, whatever it is. And they don't realize exactly all what goes into being a successful director or producer or the, the, the knowledge you need to build up to, to, to be good at it. And just like if I went to be a day trader in Wall Street tomorrow, I wouldn't even know how, what button to push. So what makes you think you can step into my world and you're just going to be good at it because you're good at that? So there's this perception that we're a little bit less competent than, <laughs> you know, that we're lucky or, you know, we're, you know, for their actors are just good looking and that's why they got to do that. And, you know, like if you look at people like Angelina and Brad Pitt, yes, they're extremely good looking, but they're really good at what they do. Look at Brad Pitt's producing track record before you call him an idiot. <laughs> you know? Like, you know, most people, if they knew what he produced, would be blown away hmm. on, on how good it's been, right? And, you know, so when you do your your job in public, which almost nobody does, it's it's literally athletes and artists, right? So if you know, you worked as an accountant tomorrow and you made a mistake. How many people would know? Five, right? If you flub your lines on Broadway or you make a, a mistake on social media or whatever, everybody knows. Or you get a bad review or you, 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 you do something inappropriate, everybody knows. So you, you have that whole having to have a thick skin, and, and not care what people say about you, which is a lot harder than people want to admit. Everybody's, yeah, I don't care what anybody thinks about me, but most people really do. And, you know, I'm trying to teach my, like my kids still do, you know, I actually truly don't because I'm older now and I've, I used to <laughs> for sure, but now I really don't, but my kids do. And I'm like, look, you're going to put out a song someday and you're going to be sitting somewhere and somebody doesn't know you and they're going to rip you about your song. And that can't affect your path because that's one person's opinion. Because you could have been sitting next to somebody who said your song was great and that shouldn't affect your path either because that's one person's opinion. So pick your path. It's it's a cliche, but art artists are about finding their truth, right? So a good story works because it rings true to you like i believe that could happen when i watch it or read it you know, <clears throat> obvious even even the fantasy stuff like the harry potters or whatever even in a world that's make-believe you believe that could be real because they're really good at telling that story they found truth in that story so same thing with her music and you know same thing with jamin i never say don't make this make that instead you know i'm saying if you're gonna make it make it correctly but like he just made this piece that you know i thought was pretty risky where it's a very avant-garde short it's like a minute and a half two minutes where he's flashing sort of negative things about the planet you know like pollution and war and he keeps saying penis but it starts really soft he's like penis penis and at the end he's screaming it and crying as as the destruction clips you know kind of kind of good thing and it's actually when you watch that all right dude i get it you know it's, pr it's pretty good but if you had just told me that idea <laughs> up front i mean mm, that's that's taking a chance. But you know what? Take the fucking chance, man. But do it correctly. It's lit well. <laughs> it's shot you well. It. You gotta find the voice. And I think that was something you mentioned also because yeah. um, so many filmmakers that focus on one project and, and only one project don't find a way to create their voice and to build yeah. this, uh, this future. And I can remember when uh, we were, you know, doing 
pitch workshops and having people submit content. Uh, and if we, when we did, oh, that was where I first met you. We did a pitch session through the Sacramento Film and Music Festival. And uh, that, um, that opportunity, everything that you're mentioning today, it, I, I swear to God, I know you've seen it a million times. I saw it, you know, instantly in the very first event that I was at with you. Um, you know, people thinking that they knew it all, people, you know, not willing to listen and not having other ideas, which to me, I feel like, man, if you've got an audience that's going to be able to help you grow or build something, you better be able to pull all your cards out of the deck and play them. Oh, and yeah. that shouldn't be, I don't know, what do you think I should do, you know? Um, so I think that's something people need to realize, too, is that it's not a one-hit wonder. This is a career. You're building a foundation, and you really need to think about what other projects are coming up, what other scripts you want to write or you want to produce that share your voice, that yeah. add, you know, the Coen Brothers films – you can tell they're Coen Brothers films, mm -hmm. but there is a huge audience that recognizes that and appreciates it and seeks that out. I think as a filmmaker, that's the best compliment you could get is if somebody is actually seeking out your work because they dig your voice. And that this, doesn't happen is, very often. This is a lifestyle. Um, and a lot of people yeah. trying to be part of it don't realize that. And I just had an interesting conversation. So there's, somebody who, who's working for me, who's young, um, who's been with me for about six years right now. And all of a sudden I heard from a, his parent, right? Who can't wrap their head around. He doesn't go somewhere from nine to five. Just doesn't get it. She thinks, well, people who don't do that are losers. Literally losers. And bad things are going to happen for them. Hmm. Can't see her child in a way. Yeah, just that is, you know, anything other than you go be, you know, a 9 to 5 life, so you know you get a paycheck every 2 weeks, you know you get 2 weeks a year vacation. And that's fine for people. I'm not saying people shouldn't do that, but this kid doesn't want to do that. He wants to have a lifestyle job as opposed to an occupation. Where you get, you know, I said to one of the interns today, I never have the same day twice. Mm -hmm. So, like, today my day was I went to the Serious Hood in Patterson with my new troop of, you know, gangster friends. And I shot a, a gangster piece today with a bunch of interns in, you know, 28 degree weather. That's, you know, based on it's a, it's a reality show. And the guy that we're portraying today probably murdered 100 people, right? Who was there also, right? So it's just like, you know, interesting people who are completely different, you know, background, walks of life, you know, from, from this intern kid. And I'm like, then I got to go home. I did our podcast and I'm doing your podcast and I made dinner for my dogs and my kids. I, it's just never the same. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to get up tomorrow at seven 30. I'm going to get up when I feel like it. And then, uh, but I'm still not going to finish work tonight. And I'm now figured that out, you know, in my fifties, like, all right, if it's not all done tonight, the world's not going to fall apart tomorrow. You know, I put in a seven, 16 hour day today. We're good, right? I'll put in one tomorrow. We'll, we'll, a lot will get done, but not all of it. And if you keep kind of the all of the pieces, like what you're saying, like don't have one thing. Yeah. You know, I, I very much communicating that to Mike. It's like my son has a romantic comedy he's writing. He has three shorts. He He's you know, was making, but COVID stopped. You know, my daughter's writing a Broadway play. Um, part of the writing team of a Broadway play. She's writing her EP, which is written. But again, right in the middle of her doing that, her studio closed. 
for a year, <laughs> you know? So you pivot. So she wrote 29 songs. Wow. Because she was so literally... I want to make sure we mention her name because she can be found on Spotify, right? Uh, she's on every platform. Okay. So Payson Maestrich, P A Y S O N. I'll, I'll type it in here. It's Payson. Oh, here. Let me put it in the public comments. And her song has made me. This is the one that's out. Okay. Um, made me insane. It's gone over 250,000 streams on Spotify, but she's on all the platforms. Um, and then my, my son's YouTube thing is called Big Lettuce. Oh, yeah. Now, if people want to listen to our podcast... Big lettuce. Share what, whatever on whenever. I think you told me, and I'm trying to remember. If I... So, um, the Big Lettuce Productions is on YouTube. Um, and then people should watch Hood Pranks because it's super funny. He reminds me of, uh, you know, do you know Smosh? Did you ever? Yeah. Or, okay. I met them out there. Yeah, yeah. Um, it kind of reminds me of that, where it really starts off as something that um, they create to entertain themselves. Yeah. You know? It's literally not for any audience other than their them and their their friends. And yet it catches on fire. And I mean, well, when what, what was really interesting this year? Um, and again, I think this year is going to have a lot of legs to it as far as how it's changed the content world. So my son um, went to college to be part of one of it's one of the top theater programs in the country. He, like he likes doing theater, mm -hmm. but there's no theater, <laughs> right? Yeah. So his school they only allowed freshmen to come. You couldn't have a roommate you couldn't have more than one person in your room at a time. There's no extracurriculars of any kind first semester. And like even eating, you're in those cubes and stuff. Right. So like they started a comedy troupe. Him and like, and it's, you know, think about that as your first year of college. It's hard to meet people like that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like just, you kind of can meet the people on your floor, sort of. But like, sure, that's your going, community. you know, <laughs> like it's hard. Yeah. And so, you know, he made some friends that, you know, my son's very social. And uh, they started this, you know, comedy group that they started making shorts where they each make a little piece or they'd break the rule and, you know, have more than three people in a room. And they're weird that they, they, they think it's hilarious. And, they're starting to find other people who think it's hilarious. And, you know, again, his things, if you look at them, there's all a kind of weird, dark, like he wants to sort of blow up the romantic comedy genre. Um, you know, he's like an Edgar Wright kind of fan. And, mm -hmm. uh, and he's, you know, he's doing it. His shorts are winning awards and, you know, he, he's he's listening about resources. Like I tell this story all the time, but I think it's kind of a good one. When I do these boot camps, that's how I met you. You know, people pitch us at the end. You know, part of the whole concept of the boot camp is we have a fund, we can make your stuff, you can pitch us, and we teach you how to pitch and all these things. And I was doing one in uh in Ohio, in Cleveland, and I'm I'm kind of creeped out by identical twins, and in the front row were two identical twins, who you know they had that thing where the one talks to the other one and he talks to you, and you know I give this whole weekend course on how to pitch and blah blah. blah. This one kid just walks up to pitch with his laptop, and he goes, "My pitch will be, I think I'll just hit play." Like it couldn't be more cocky, right? Hits play on the laptop. One of the best shorts I've ever seen in my life. 
They spent $100 on it. They made it in Ashtabula, Ohio. And it's just great. And it's about kids who understand how to tell a story visually without having access to bells and whistles. So that's so important now, I think, because we see so much stuff that will never see the light of the day because they tried to make a fantasy film on the cheap or an effects film on the cheap or a comedy on the cheap where the sound is terrible and all these things are terrible. These kids knew how to make great stuff with no resources because they didn't require any resources for the story. So I'll give you an example. You know, those 48 hour film festivals, which yeah. I'm kind of against. Yeah. Um, they won every one they ever entered. So the one, the first one I saw that they entered was a horror film. Um, 48 hour horror film. And all these people are trying to do head severed and blah, blah, blah. They took a butcher block table, like a square one, and they put candles around it and sort of backlit a kitchen and those sort of eerie, creepy light. And they it was an old one with an apple core on it where you like stick an apple on the thing and it and you yep. rotate it and it peels it. Yep. And so that was it with a sound effect of like, ah! 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 It was like somebody having their skin peeled off, right? And then somebody came in and ate the app. It's genius, right? They can make it easily in 48 hours. <laughs> so the time resource didn't affect them. They didn't cost anything. You needed candles and an apple. So the money resource didn't do it. And they were just really good at simple storytelling. You yeah. completely got, got it <laughs> as soon as you heard the sound effects. And you could use your imagination on what that looks like. Yeah. So, you know, that's another thing I, I think to convey to aspiring whatever is, is just be simple. Just tell, tell a clean story. And if you don't have the money or the resources, don't do that part. But trying to make Star Wars for 300 grand never works. Yeah. Yeah. Because Star Wars exists. <laughs> So why would I watch your Star Wars when I could watch the Star Wars that's Star Wars, but right. cheap, cheap, cheaper version of it? Like, there's spoiled food and there's food you could eat. You know what I mean? So <laughs> that's the most common thing that I see from young filmmakers is just trying to do too much. Yeah. Trying to change his genre or, you know... Whatever. So, um, well, I want to, um, I, I mean, I definitely want to bring you back and talk about very specific things and, and probably even go back to, you know, we, we did a, a weekend workshop, a film boot camp, um, for sure. several years that was a lot of fun and really engaging, allowed people to get really immersed, um, in with with you which is valuable and uh something even to break it up into pieces because one of the things that we have happening in this region is we now have some film development and you know a full-time film commissioner which is we didn't even have um there's a lot of opportunity for growth and i want people to really learn uh in you know in today's vernacular and scenarios, how to deal with um, filmmaking, how to respond, how to approach it. Um, and I think the one thing that ties in that everybody seems to struggle with is pitching. Yep. It's the hardest thing to do is to talk about yourself and pitch yourself. And yet when you're in this business, whether you are selling a script, whether you're looking for investors, whether you're you're trying to secure actors, all of those things require you to be able to pitch yourself and your project and who you are and why somebody should trust in you. And so I really feel like um, I know that's something that you 
uh, were very skilled in, and that hasn't changed. You know, the ability to pitch, how to pitch, uh, you know, who to pitch to and what you're pitching for probably has changed a little bit. But that gut ability of, you know, knowing your work, knowing what you can do and getting out there and saying it the right way at the right time. I was telling somebody recently um, when I was in New York with you and the New York women in film had a, a pitch fest, you know, had you come in for the afternoon and, and I'm thinking, okay, this is women filmmakers in New York city. This is going to be bitching. I can't believe how much talent we're going to see in this room. And you always would say, you know, in this pitch environment, when you're pitching, I want you to pitch me in this particular order, this, and then this, and then this, and then this. And you were very specific because that's what you needed to be able to envision their project. Right. And one after the other, one after the other, one after the other stood up and completely fucked up. Didn't say it in the right way. Didn't say what they, you were asking for. And I thought, this isn't even about how do you pitch. This is about listening. Right. Know, you know, know your audience, read your room. Solid. Well, well, do you remember how many women asked to direct that day? I do. Oh, well, not very many. There were a hundred women in the room. Seven asked to be the director. Right. Right. A little bit farther in, in women. And we still need to support that. Definitely. You were the first one that brought that to my attention. Um, but it just, you know, it never ceases to surprise me how prepared people should be when opportunity is handed to them. Yep. And they are not there in all their capacities to take advantage of it. And that's just a shame. Yeah. You so should be prepared. It, yeah. I think that's like something. Um, for doomsday. Right. <laughs> you right. should be prepared. You never know when you're going to be on a elevator with somebody when you're going to be in a in a cruise you know wherever you are where you meet somebody who can do something for you you know right. plus again as as artists there's a a constant overwhelming need for money <laughs> all of the time because every time you need to create something certainly in the film and television side of it you need a budget. So right. if you're going to fund that yourself every time you, you, you by definition need third parties. Yeah. So wherever that comes from, well, you know, I sat next to, you know, the, <laughs> the Bloomingdale's air on the plane and she's really interested in documentaries. Well then have a documentary ready. Right. Like the next week. <laughs> Cause you just made a connection that, that, that might work. And, and, and don't shut yourself off to, you know, that, that was one thing that always blew my mind about LA, LA Hollywood stuff is, oh, well, I'm not going to talk to you unless you have an agent. I'm not going to talk to you unless you have this. Like, well, wh why? Y you know, like, you're going to miss out on so many opportunities by having, I only deal with this sort of small group of people. That's just elitism. That's just elitism, don't you think? I, I, it's just... <laughs> Yeah, it, and it's just fear. I think a lot of a lot of this industry is based on fear of, you know, I'm going to lose my job at a studio or an agency if I don't produce. Um, as a filmmaker, I'm gonna nobody's gonna like it. I'm gonna lose my money. I'm gonna get bad bad reviews. And again, if you look at the sort of consistently successful people, they're not frightened. Mm -hmm. you know and if something bad happens or there's a bad film or a bad turn in your company move on yeah you know like i learned that from sports you make a bad play if you keep thinking about it they're going to get you the next play right you know, have a short memory about stuff and you know bad you're going to make bad movies you're going to make bad tv series you're going to have bad quarters in your business. You're just, just shit's going to happen. Like that's just, just it is. So if you're frightened of it, and again, if you make the sports analogy, I play football. Everybody was scared of getting hurt, got hurt. Mm. Always. And usually got hurt the worst. 
Mm -hmm. people weren't really worried about getting hurt, didn't get hurt that much because you're just more relaxed and you're not thinking about it all the time. And same thing with this industry. If you think it's not going to work, kind of not going to work. If you're not willing to put in the grind, not going to work. Yeah. Well, there's nobody I know who gets by on, 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 on sheer talent. Well, it's not for everybody. And if it was easy, everybody would do it, yeah. you know? So that's where, you know, when I see people rise, when I see the cream rise to the top, those are the elements that are part of that. People that are able to grow and learn and, you know, be able to uh, uh, take, take what they've picked up from the, the worst possible scenario and, in their next project, they'll make sure it doesn't happen again. So, and work. I, you know, like I tell my daughter that I'm like, you look at, you know, she likes like Lana Del Rey and Halsey. I'm like, I'm like, you think those girls don't work? Those girls work their ass off, right? And right. they're talented. <laughs> but you told me also that uh, Payson's producer is the same producer as her, right? Yeah. So her, I mean. If nothing else, knowing that she's in company with someone who uh, has really recognized talent that's out there that can hopefully turn that over to her yeah. and do the same thing for her if she's got all the right skills. Right. You know, she doesn't have the skills, doesn't matter who the fuck her producer is or mm -hmm. whether or not she is in a relationship with her or not. Um, but yeah, and that's the other misperception about our industry. So being talented, that's the baseline. Yeah. If you're not talented at this, it doesn't matter. You're not it's you're not going to be successful. Yeah. You can't work past that. But so talent is the baseline. If you feel you have talent at any part of this, producing, writing, directing, acting, music, whatever, then you got to get to work. Yeah. Cuz there's somebody out there who's just as talented who's going to try to outwork you. Right. And if you, again, if you look at sort of role model type people, look at LeBron. Nobody works harder than him. Look at Kobe. Nobody worked harder than him. And they're actually more talented than everybody else on top of it. Yeah. They look at Tom Brady. Like those guys work <laughs> and work and work and work right. to maintain that level of being more talented. It's the same in our business. It's like, you know, you got to work, you got to pay attention to, you know, like I, I tell my kids while you're being creative, watch CNBC. Know what's going on in the economy. <laughs> know what's going on in the economy in Europe. Yeah. Or places of people who can, you know, fund your business, fund your projects. Like, because if you ever have an opportunity to talk to those people and you're completely clueless as to how their world works, they're not going to invest in you. Yeah. You know. Well, I, I could talk to you all night, but I know it's it's midnight there. Larry's on the East Coast and he yeah. uh, he was able to meet up with us, but I don't think it's your bedtime for quite a few hours still anyway. So No, not yet. <laughs> um, I'm going to, I'm going to wrap it up and know, uh, know everybody that Larry has, you know, an opportunity with Sacramento that we're, we're not going to, uh, let go because I think that all of us can benefit from the experience of learning and we would really want to bring him into an environment where it can be, uh, engaging and, you know, educational and things that we can do that are kind of outside of just this yak it up kind of conversation. Um, but I, I miss you and I love you and I am very happy to see, uh, that you're there and you're still doing great things. Um, it's always fun to just chat. So forgive us if we wandered off into some areas because, uh, it's just really nice to kind of yeah, um, I'd love to come back to Sacramento. I'm just not going to shatter my arm this time. And yeah, we will not put you on a horse. No horses. Never again. No, I'm good. Yeah. But, um, uh, yeah, it's well, great. Well, I'm going to uh, I'm gonna, uh, close it off. And I want to, um, just before I close, I just want to make a mention. Uh, there was a notice that I just posted on our Facebook page. And I wanted to just take a minute to um, recognize uh, one of our members, Larry Shade. Uh, Larry was 
actually murdered last Saturday, Sunday. Um, yeah, there was, I don't even know the details of it yet. Um, he's a, someone who's been working in film for many years and has worked on lots of different projects and literally the nicest man and most genuine human being I think I've ever met. Uh, so I don't know the circumstances, but uh, the CFAA certainly appreciates him for everything that he was. And we're very sorry that this, this happened. So if you don't already know about it, we wanted to share. Um, and I didn't want to let this go without at least acknowledging the people that really make a difference in this industry. Um, usually make a difference because they're just really, really genuinely nice people and they do things for the right purposes and in the right way um, along with having that talent. And Larry was one of those people. So ironically, same name as you, but um, so anyway, thank you for letting me just share that. And we are going to sign off. Uh, and you guys, uh, this will not be the last time that you see Larry. So we'll figure out uh, where we can bring him in again and how we can do that. Thank you guys for uh, hanging in and watching again. We could be carrying this on all day long, uh, but this is, uh, this is long enough now. So Larry can go take a bath and read some more scripts. Yeah. Bath time. <laughs> yeah. Okay, buddy. Thanks, Thanks so much. Bye.